also sitting alone, contemplating, pondering here at the Sea of Galilee. Families, individuals, friends, spouses. Yesterday a group came back, a German group that were here already a couple of days ago. A mom and her nine adult children. The husband had passed away 23 years ago. All the grandkids were at home with the other the spouses partners and so this family was here together a very special time good morning hey you know my name of where are you guys from ah uh, yeah from minnesota yeah, so okay you know i just realized oh come on come on the holy spirit's wisdom not mine <laughs> Uh, praise God. So you think uh, you were a hard case and that when God moved you, that was a big deal? Wow. Well, praise God. Yeah, praise it God. Was the best time. And you got nice pictures there. Yeah, we're waiting for the sunrise. Praise God. So you're here. You're this is live. This is live. This is a great experience. Oh, really? This is online? Yeah, yeah, you're live. I hope I didn't. Uh, oh, there's the sun. There's another group here from Minnesota, a Catholic group. I must put you guys together. But you're leaving this morning, right? Yeah, we're leaving. Why did you leave? This is such a nice place. I mean, not necessarily, but there's uh, some activities I'm going to connect for you there. Okay? the shrouded terrain and some other things. Everybody has their time and their moment. Those three ladies were surely good friends, and there we have another couple. All the relationships in life, how they're places of blessing. Classmates, co-workers, neighbors, even those what we call chance encounters. Everything is in the domain of providence. I find it fascinating today with the readings to notice a huge uh, change, a very evident change, and a deep connection between the two readings. And I'd just like to point out <coughs> two of the features. So now we're starting to read John chapter 6, which in a very special way is an Easter gospel, an Easter chapter. And it's interesting to read it from this time of the year when we're very conscious, conscious of just having celebrated Easter. It's interesting how what you're going through in life affects how you see a lot of other things go happening in life. And if you're going through something different, you see them from a different angle. And so just in the, in the uh, context of Easter, to read... The last line, I think it's the last line today, just hold on a second, of the gospel passage, it has a lot more meaning. So it's after the multiplication of the loaves, the crowds are super enthusiastic, and they're drawing attention to Jesus, and they're saying this must be, must be the, the prophet who is to come. 
And what does Jesus do? He withdraws to the mountain alone, maybe up there. Just to give us a little geography here. If we're looking right there, we have the Mount of Beatitudes there in that spot where you have, well, at least where we remember today, the Mount of Beatitudes. So you have those plastic covers there over the bananas or the protection nets over the bananas. And just down below that here at the water, there's enough of high water now and the vegetation is thinned out so we can see right to the primacy of Peter and the multiplication of the loaves. So this is the scene where it happens, okay? And then he went to a mountain alone, so anywhere up there in those hills would work. And the text says, Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king. You know, public proclamation. And why? Because they saw the miracle of the loaves and fish and the thousands and thousands who were fed. And Jesus withdrew again to the mountain alone. He didn't want that. And he didn't want it, not because he just didn't like it. It was not the plan of his life. It was not his identity. Because his identity to be king was on Calvary. And the sign over the cross is Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And so, Pilate asks, do you want me to crucify your king? We have no king except Caesar. So the whole issue here of power, of religious power, of political power, of influence in society, of how to exercise it, of how to be king. Because Jesus also said to Pilate, yes, you said it, I am king. But my kingdom is not of this world. A very different kingdom. A very different kingdom. Sometimes we think there's only one kind of kingdom. But just like there's so many different kinds of grasses and flowers and plants, and critters and birds singing and chirps like we're hearing right now in the background. There are different types of kingdoms. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of a completely different order. And I'm actually willing to be crucified for my kingdom. And I'm actually willing to forgive all those who crucify me so they can enter my kingdom. Now that's a real upheaval of the idea of kings and kingdom and parties and Herod the Great and Herod Antipas and Augustus and Tiberius and all the kings up to the present day, all the people who wield political power. And now put that in the context as, as the backdrop. You know, when the disciples see this, they must be a little bit shocked, you know, because they're beginning to like Jesus, his teaching. They want to follow him. They feel kind of special, you know, James and John at some point. One of the stories says they get the mother involved. Really, and they want the first places in the kingdom to sit at his right and his left. And you said, do you realize what you're asking for? And how do we see them today in the first reading? Well, they were arrested, they were tried. The authorities want to put them to death. A very wise man, the Sanhedrin, stands up. When somebody stands up in a circle of people, it draws a lot of attention, commands a lot of attention. And he said, hey guys, listen up. We got cases of trouble in the past. I did figure I heard a fishing line crack through the air, and there is the fisherman. Hmm. 
So then they changed the, the strategy and they called them in and they warned them not to preach and teach again. And they flogged them. And just like we heard the whiplash there of the line, the fishing line going out into the water, you have the, the whiplash of the whips coming down on their backs. And these are the guys that would really have liked if Jesus had become king there at the multiplication of the loaves and they'd love to have the first places in his kingdom. And at one point Jesus says to them, you will sit on the 12, on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes. They must have felt happy about that, you know, big shots. But what do we see them doing today? Well, <clears throat> after recalling the apostles, they had them flogged, ordered them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus and dismissed them. So they must be pretty hurting as they're going out. They left the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. Now, if you translate, translate the name into Hebrew, it gives you Hashem. But the word Hashem means in the Hebrew colloquial speak, in formal speak, it means God because they don't want to say the word God. So they say Hashem to refer to God. And it's clear here, it's the name of Jesus. So there we see also in John's Gospel, a very clear statement of faith in the person of Jesus. Sometimes you have people saying that Constantine was the one who, who uh, made Jesus God, so to say. Crazy theories. But there we have it here in the, this chapter 6 of John's Gospel. And they were, <clears throat> sorry, this were in the Acts of the Apostles, so this is much younger, earlier. Rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And then the next line says, all day long, both at the temple and in their homes, they did not stop teaching and proclaiming the Christ, the Christ Jesus. So they're, they're continuing, they're not deterred by the flogging. And they feel honored that they were able to suffer something for the sake of Jesus. For the sake of this plan that God had revealed through Jesus. This Egyptian goose has a little problem with fleas, probably. I knew a priest is deceased now, and he had his sense of humor. And he asked what was the shortest poem that was ever written. And the poem has a title. And the poem is Adam Hadam. That's it, that's the poem. And the title was Fleas. Adam had him. If we got on the right side of the, or we got the, this goose to turn around, but we could see the color of her wings, or his wings, I'm not sure if it's a he or she. Where are you gone, goose? Try to get the camera to focus on the goose. 
So isn't that an amazing turnaround in the disciples that they who would love to have seen Jesus King and sitting at the right hand, they're able to suffer for him and happy to do that. As happy as they would have been sitting at his right hand, now they're in a very different kind of happiness. This kingdom, the spiritual kingdom is very different than the material kingdom and what we think as kingdom. There you can see some of the gleaming green there on her feathers. Let me get it for you. You should just lift up her wings now. It's, it's a, beautiful, a beauty in, the, in all of that. It's amazing how nature works, isn't it? Look at that, the way the feathers open up. When I get this close, she feels safer in the water. So people, God bless you, great to see you today, blessings from the Sea of Galilee, here we are, see you later alligators.